All right, guys, so this is chapter five of the electronic health record curriculum that you're working through, and today we're gonna to be talking about administrative use in the medical office. So with this lecture and these assignments to come forward, you're really gonna start using your SIM charts for the medical office a lot more. You're gonna start working through uh, and, and really playing around with the, the charts. So some of the things that we're gonna to discuss today, we're gonna, I'm gonna explain the importance of a typical duties of the front office assistant. We'll discuss the necessity of respectful communication among providers, staff, and patients when answering the telephone, sending email messages, uh, faxing, and scheduling appointments. We'll create telephone messages in the SIM chart for the medical office, and we'll explain why a provider might send a letter to a healthcare provider or a patient and learn how to create one of those in the EHR. We'll also generate patient correspondences in the SIM charts. We'll outline uh, the procedure for management of EHRs, including eliminating duplicate charts, the proper way of um, purging closed patient records, and the importance of backing up an EHR system. We'll create and manage patient appointments in the calendar, and we'll also discuss the role of front office while maintaining the waiting room. So, our role as a front office medical assistant, or a medical administrative assistant. Um, some of the key as aspects and attributes that we need to have and be able to do are to be able to have a positive attitude at all times. We are the face of the medical office. We are the first person that they come in and see and they interact with, and the way that you present yourself represents the, medical, the, the office as a whole. Uh, we need to greet uh, patients on the phone as well as in person. We'll have to create and manage an EHR for each patient that comes in through the office. We need to generate patient letters and correspondences, and we also need to provide patient education material to patients. So let's talk about communication in the medical office. Uh, good communication will improve the, the patient's confidence in their care. If the patients feel like they are well informed, that they have an open communication line between the clinic and themselves, they will put a lot more trust into the clinic and they will feel like uh, they're, they're a lot more satisfied when leaving the clinic. Uh, and this also helps safeguard confidentiality. If, if you have that confidence uh, within each other, the patient in, to the providers, as well as the providers in the facility to the patient, it will help um, the confidentiality aspect of it. So some of the things that we'll have to do are be able to generate correspondences in the SIM charts. So there's a couple ways you can do this, and if you, if you want to click along um, on the SIM charts as we go through this, um, feel free. You will you need this uh, a ton of times throughout the assignments with this, with this chapter. So how to create correspondences, um, you can access this from any module, whether it be the front office, the, the, back, uh, the back office, or uh, the billing and coding portion as well. Um, but basically, you click on the correspondence link, and then you will select the type of correspondence from the left-hand panel, uh, whether it be a letter, email, uh, or phone, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you can perform a patient search to link it to the patient record. So once you create a patient correspondence, you can print the saved document anytime from the patient dashboard. So that's really cool to know. So some patient correspondences. Some of the things that you'll have to write for the patient uh, to, or to the patients could be referral letters, it could be a letter to the patient, it could be an email, it could be a phone message, and basically this will increase the satisfaction and understanding among patients that you know how to do all this um, and that, that you can communicate anyway throughout this. Um, and this also will help safeguard that confidentiality. So when talking on the telephone, we will get more into this when you get into the AMA portion of the book, um, but this is really important guys. Um, just think about this. Have you ever called the doctor's office and gotten someone who did not sound cheerful? And, and did that in influence your opinion on the office? You know, if somebody just answered the, the telephone and, and they just sound like they woke up and had a bad day, it really puts a damper on that, that phone call. So it's important to leave a good first impression. So that telephone is usually the first communication between the staff and the patient. So it's, a good, uh, it's good to make a great first impression because if that's the first time they ever talk to you and, and you sound not pleased and upset, you know, it, it doesn't leave a good lasting impression. It's important to be professional, positive, and then use a pleasant tone when answering the phone. Um, the, the best thing, the best advice I can give you is even when you're in here working the switchboard room, is to always answer with a smile. You know, if, you're, if you answer with a smile, it's really hard to not sound positive. So here are some common uh, types of phone calls you can see in the medical office. Uh, it could be an appointment request from a patient. They're calling in and they want to schedule an appointment in the office and they just need to call in to try to get that done. Um, it could be an inquiry from a prospective patient about the practice. So it could be a new patient or a patient that's looking for a provider and they want to know what you can offer them. It, it could be a request from, uh, for medical advice from a physician or a nurse. Maybe you're working in a specialty clinic or you work for a specialist 
and um, a, another physician from outside or a nurse from an, another clinic or facility calls and asks for advice. It could be a prescription refill requests. It could be insurance and billing questions from patients. And it also could be in, uh, information requests from insurance companies. Uh, it's also common to get questions from pharmacists, medical supply vendors, and other medical offices over the phone. So you never know who's going to be on the other line. It's important that you always make the best first impression, no matter who the person is. Here's some guidelines for proper telephone etiquette. Okay. So do not use the telephone lines for personal conversations. Keep your cell phone conversations short and private and take such calls while only on your break. Never use the, the, the work time to answer your own personal business. Do not wear a Bluetooth or other cellular ear, earphone or earpiece devices during your work hours. If it is your office policy to have a headset to answer the work phone, that is acceptable. However, you should not be wearing your personal Bluetooth devices in, in the workplace. Uh, try to greet the caller by the second ring if possible. Yeah, this just shows that you're attentive and, and even if you're on the other line, you know, ask the other patient to hold as soon as you can and answer that call. Um, answer the call with a professional and pleasant greeting such as, good morning, Dr. Uh, Mason's office. This is Amber. How can I help you today? Um, and that, that's, a great, that's a great opening sentence and that's a great way to start the call because you've identified the office, Dr. Mason's office. You've identified yourself. This is Amber. And then you asked if you could help them. So this is, this is really good. Uh, it's important to also speak slowly and clearly, adjusting your volume if you know or suspect the caller has a hearing uh, defect or, or deficiency. Um, and, and again, guys, smile as you answer the phone. The, ca the callers are able to hear that cheerfulness in your voice. Some more guidelines. Um, once you answer the phone, make sure you obtain the caller's full name, a return number, and a reason for the call. It's also important to verify any spelling and contact numbers for accuracy and summarize the reason briefly and precisely so that when you pass that message on to whoever it pertains to, they can pick up right from where you left off. If it's necessary to place the caller on hold during the call, do so only after you're asking the patient's permission and awaiting for a response. Don't just say, I'm putting you on hold. Uh, limit the whole time to less than a minute if possible. If it's more than a minute, just check back in with the caller and make sure everything is still all right. Uh, document, document your conversation with the caller along with the time and date and your initials. All right, this just shows who handled the call and when that call took place. So to ensure that all the caller's questions have been answered, allow them to end the conversation. All right, so ask, is there anything else that I can help you with today? No, and that they could respond, no, thank you. You know, very, thank you very much. Have a great day. You know, and that's a great way to end the, the phone call. You will have appointment confirmation calls that come into the clinic. Um, so automated systems are available for making confirmation calls, but most small and medium-sized practice front office uh, medical administrative assistants are expected to do so. So if you have an automated system, it's a luxury. It's not going to happen in most settings. So if you do have to make those appointment confirmation calls, it's important to, um, to do so properly. And this is basically a reminder that the doctor has reserved this time for that patient. So you're just calling to remind them of that. It's also a request to return the call uh, to confirm the appointment if you don't receive anybody. Uh, it's a request to bring the appointment. Uh, you also need to request uh, the patients to bring an appointment to the appointment a list of all the current medications that they are. And it's also a reminder for the patient to check on his or her referral status if the patient's company requires a referral. So it's important, you know, the appointment confirmation calls are uh, important all the way around. So on these EHR systems, it also comes with secure email servers. So this is good because they're inexpensive. It's quicker than the regular snail mail or the postal services. It comes with encryption technology, which, it, which will improve and boost security. It also will include a, a um, HIPAA disclosure statement. And then you have EHR messaging that you can use, which is inner office only, and you can have patient access on there. So using this messaging system built into the EHR application, and says that there's secure delivery of email within the practice and offers a way to communicate with staff regarding confidential patient information. So there's some, here are some guidelines. If you look on box, uh, page 118 and box 5-3, you'll see the guidelines for sending a professional email. I'm not going to read into this, but it is important that you educate yourself with this box uh, because you will be asked questions about this on the, on the test. So just remember, guys, that it's always important that you make sure the email correspondence re uh, reflects professionalism. When you send those emails out, you're not only representing yourself, but you're, you're representing the entire office. So messaging in the SIM chart for the medical office. 
So this will allow, it allows users to send and receive messages with other staff members and patients. And this can be found under the correspondence link on the left hand side, um, info panel, you can get in there. But it's important that you verify the email address of the recipient to ensure that the message in, uh, reaches the correct person and not somebody who is not intended for. You will have to fax out of a medical office. So the fax is like an email, enables quicker a message transmission than the traditional mail. However, it poses several security and integrity risks. Um, for, for instance, faxes can be misdirected because of human error or technical glitches. The recipient of the fax cannot be verified because anybody can pick up the printed document in the machine if the machine is placed in an unsecure location. And it is also difficult to verify that all the pages were received. So those are kind of the downfalls to a fax machine. But there are also some guidelines to abide by as well. So when you're sending a fax, you should inform the person that it's intended for, or the recipient, uh, and you should inform them before sending that confidential information out so that they can be retrieved immediately and they can be waiting for that fax. It's also important to use a cover sheet when sending a fax. Um, and basically the cover sheet needs to include the sender's contact information, a confidentiality disclaimer, and the recipient's uh, information and who it's intended for. And then once you send that fax, it's important to follow up with the intended recipient to ensure that that message was received. So when you send a fax, document the date and time, the initial fax information, uh, to help you create a paper trail to cover, cover yourself in, in cases of litigation. And also, once you've completed that fax, you need to file the completed cover sheet in the patient's chart. Um, so you also have to manage electronic records. So the EHR is only as good as its security. So EHR systems have to be monitored daily. You need to ensure that proper software updates have been taken place and you always can need to continue training efforts. All right, there's always room to grow and to learn more. Never be satisfied with the way your, your clinic is running. And then this is the entire responsibility of the entire office. It just doesn't sit on one person. Um, this sits on the entire office. So it's important with EHR systems not to have duplicate charts. So duplication creates a serious problem because it divides the patient information in between two charts. So here are a couple of ways to help eliminate those duplication charts, or duplicated charts, excuse me. Um, whether, so when the, first patient, when the patient first comes in, ask whether the patient has ever been seen by the practice before. If they have, use the already established EHR. Uh, you should ask established patients if they have had a name change. Always set up the patient, patient EHR account using the name listed on the insurance card, uh, and that is essential, guys. So patient records. So HIPAA law states that the patient health record must be kept permanently, not that it must be, remain in the office. Okay, so there's a difference. I'll reread that. HIPAA law states that the patient health record must be kept permanently, however, it must not that it must remain in the office. So there are three types of patient records. There are uh, three, three different groups it's, it's, it could be. It could be active, inactive, or closed. So active records, the patient has been seen within the clinic within the past six months. Inactive records, the patient hasn't been seen in the office in the past six months. And closed records is either the patient has transferred or changed physicians, they have moved to another facility, or they have passed away. So the retention periods, vary from state to state. Now, retention period is how long you have to hold on to these health records. Uh, patient health records must be maintained for evidence of patient care in the event, event of a lawsuit is filed. So, and then there's purging. And purging is the process of removing inactive and closed patient records from those that are active. It's also important that to the front office and, and administrative aspects that we back up the electronic health record. So patient confidentiality and security must remain as such a priority for the backup copies as it is the primary, e, uh, as for the primary EHR systems in the medical office. All right, it's a, you can back these up in many different ways. You can back them up on a secondary offsite location or a charged portable laptop. You could ha have a backup system purchased through another vendor and the offices must have a written backup and recovery plan in place and those will be included in your policies and procedures manuals. So the calendar function on your EHR system and on your SIM charts. Uh, so the calendar is an electronic appointment book and it's the key to efficient time management within the office. So some of the benefits, several users can access this electronic book at the same time. If you had just a paper medical book, say this was your appointment schedule book, 
Okay, this is the only hard copy that there was. Only one person can access that at the time. However, with this electronic appointment book, um, multiple users can access this at the same time. It can also be printed out on, uh, daily so that the doctors, the medical assistants, the nurses, and the receptionists are all aware of the patient load for the day and what to expect going forward. And it also allows the patients to be easily rescheduled and appointment availability can be searched based upon the patient preferences. So when an appointment is scheduled, the patient demographic information is auto-populated into the appointment book and this allows the healthcare staff to verify insurance eligibility, confirm appointment dates, and edit patient information. So it makes the, the entire front office much more efficient than the uh, paper medical or uh, payment, paper appointment book. So the calendar views. So the SimChart in the medical office scheduling system offers many different views uh, accessible from the blue tabs on the left hand side of the screen. You can look at a daily view or a weekly or a monthly view. You can look at the exam rooms or the providers. So users can also view a patient's next schedule appointment by using the search field. So there's many different things and this helps um, navigate through the, through the appointment schedule book so much more by being able to change all these views and look at the way you need to look at it. So there's three types of, uh, types of appointments that you can enter into the SIM charts. Um, so appointments are entered into the system using the add appointment button on the left hand side of the calendar once you get into the SIM chart. Uh, now there are three different types of appointments. You can uh, schedule a patient appointments, whether they are new patient, established patient, follow-ups, uh, whatever it is. You can block out appointment times. Now this is good for holidays or lunch hours or travels or, or something like that. And then there's also an other uh, appointment style which you can do staff uh, meetings and vendor meetings and things like that. So here's how you block an appointment in time. So appointment slots should be blocked out as soon as you know the time has become unavailable. Holidays and other office closings should also be blocked out at the beginning of the year as you, as you won't schedule uh, appointments on those days. So these are, are done to account for routine days off, such as holidays, to schedule provider vacations, business travel, and personal time off, to block time uh, off before and after lunch. It's also due to accommodate ur urgent care and then reserve doctor-only booking slots. Now with this, you need to be aware of double booking. So double booking is assigning more than one patient to the same appointment slot. So for example, some may only allow double booking during the first appointment of the day, whereas others prefer double booking slots directly before their lunch hour. All right, so these are performed when the practice expects a no-show, uh, or they expect the patient to arrive early or late, uh, or the, the appointment is expected to be brief, uh, or the appointment requires different rooms and different resources. Okay, you can schedule two appointments if they're gonna be in different places and using different things, or if it's an urgent medical uh, problem that needs to be taken care of immediately. But one thing you need to be aware of, and, and as our jobs as front office medical assistants, is the patient flow of the office. So the goal of efficient scheduling is to optimize that patient flow throughout the office and the practice. An efficient flow rec requires an accurate estimation of patient volume. Scheduling must be realistic given the provider's general pace. So it's, it's important to know how fast the patient or the provider works, what the patient needs to have done, and things like that. Um, so you will have to take care and manage that waiting room. So it's, and you need to ensure that the, uh, the waiting room is well lit, clean, and safe as well. It has to have reading materials in the medical office, and it should not include potentially offensive topics. The reading materials should, in the medical office should be current and up to date as well. And, and then use the waiting room as an opportunity to promote healthy lifestyles with, with promotional flyers and posters and other types of reading materials as well. And that's it for this section, guys. Okay, that was chapter five, the administrative use of the medical office, or I'm sorry, administrative use of the electronic health record. All right, this, guys, is just a, a generalized uh, overview of the entire chapter. It's really important that you educate yourself further going on. Use your chapter reviews and your, and your SIM chart exercises to really get, uh, capture what I'm trying to give out to you guys here. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Other than that, good luck and have fun.